reading through the Bible in one year, January 23rd, Genesis 24, Matthew 23, Nehemiah 13, and Acts chapter 23. Abraham was now old, getting on in years as a man of, let me see, his wife was 127 when she died, and he's 10 years older, so a guy pushing 140, right? So he's getting pretty old. And the Lord had blessed him in everything. Abraham said to his servant, the elder of his household who managed all that he owned, place your hand under my thigh. Now, this is kind of gross, and I'm not going to go into the history behind this or what it actually means, but you can look it up on your own. It's just a thing they did. It's kind of grody, but that's okay. So, um, place your hand under my thigh, and I will have you swear by the Lord, God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not uh, take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I live, but you will go back to my land and uh, my family to take a wife for my son Isaac. The servant said to him, suppose the, the woman is unwilling to follow me to this land. Should I have your son go back to the land that you came from? And Abraham answered him, make sure that you don't take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who gave me from my father's house, or rather who took me from my father's house and from my native land, who spoke to me, swore to me, I will give this land to your offspring. He will send his angel before you and you can take uh, a wife for my son from there. If the woman is unwilling to follow you, then you are free from this oath to me. But don't let my son go back there. Now, why can't he go back? Is there some sort of prohibition? No, but he said that this is the land where God said is going to be ours. So I don't want him to leave it. So the servant placed his hand under his master Abraham's thigh and swore an oath to him uh, concerning this matter. The servant took... Uh, Ten of his master's camels, and with all kinds of his master's good, goods in hand, and went to Aram uh, Naharaim, to Nahor's town. At evening, the time when the women went out to draw water, he came, rather, <clears throat> he made the camels kneel beside a well outside of town. At evening, I already said that, Lord, God of my master Abraham, he prayed. Make this happen for me today and show kindness to my master Abraham. I am standing here at the spring where the daughters of the men of the town are coming out to draw water. Let the girl to whom I say, please lower your water jug so that I may drink. And who responds, drink, and I will water your camels also. Let her be the one who you have appointed for, my, for your servant Isaac. By this, I will know that you have shown kindness to, you, my, to my master. Before he had finished speaking, there was Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor, coming with a jug on her shoulder. Now, the girl was very beautiful, a virgin. No man had been intimate with her. And she went down to the spring and filled her jug and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, Please, let me have a little water from your jug. And she replied, Drink, my lord. And she quickly lowered her jug to her hand and gave him a drink. When as she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will also draw water for your camels until they've had enough to drink. She quickly uh, emptied her jug into the trough, uh, and, or trough and hurried to, to the well again to draw water. And she drew water for all his camels. Well, the man silently watched her to see whether... Um, the, to see whether or not the Lord had made his journey a success. As the water, as the camels finished drinking the water, the man took a gold ring weighing half a shekel uh, and for her wrist two bracelets weighing ten shekels of gold. Whose daughter are you? He asked. Please tell me, is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? She answered him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. She also said to him, We have plenty of straw and feed and a place to spend the night. There we go. Then the man knelt low, worshiping the Lord, and said, Blessed be the Lord, 
the God of my master Abraham, who has not withheld his kindness and faithfulness from my master. As for me, the Lord has led me on the journey to the house of my master's relatives. Well, the girl ran and told her mother's household about these things. Again, because it's weird, right? But also it's at least interesting, uh, given the, 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 the fact that he's saying these things about their family. Now, Rebecca had a brother named Laban. This is very important, and it comes up later. But Laban is seeing this man come with all of this, the, 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 the trappings of wealth. This one servant comes with 10 camels and tons of things uh, going with him, right? So he sees these things and recognizes this is a rich guy, and he's my family, right? Okay, this is important, comes up later. So Laban ran, uh, ran out to the man at the spring. As soon as he saw the ring and, and the, the bracelets on his sister's wrists, and when he had heard uh, his sister Rebecca's words, this man said to me, he went out to the man, and he was standing there by the camels at the spring. And Laban said, Come, you who are blessed by the Lord. Uh, why are you standing out here? I have prepared the house and a place for the camels. He's trying to entreat himself with him. So the man came to the house, and the camels were unloaded. Straw and feed were given to the camels, and water was brought to wash his feet and the feet of the men with him. A meal was set before him, but he said, I will not eat until I have said what I have to say. So Laban said, please speak. I am Abraham's servant, he said. The Lord has greatly blessed my master, and he has become rich, and he has given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and male and female slaves and camels and donkeys. Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master in her old age. And he has given him everything he owns. My master put me under this oath. You will not take a wife for my son from, <clears throat> excuse me, from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I live, but will go to my father's family and to my clan and to take a wife for my son. But I said to my master, suppose the woman will not come back with me. He said, the Lord before whom I have walked will send his angel with you and make your journey a success. And you will take a wife for my son, for my clan, and for my father's family. Then you'll be free from my oath if you go to my family and they do not give her to you. You will be free from my oath. Today, when I came to the spring, I prayed, Lord, God of my master Abraham. Again, that's capital L-O-R-D. Um which is translated as Yahweh. The same thing, actually, that uh, Laban said, because he recognized the name Yahweh, and he used it himself, again, to entreat himself with him. <clears throat> if only you will make my journey successful. I am standing here at a spring. Let the young woman who comes to draw the water, uh, and I say to her, please let me drink a little water from your jug, and who responds to me, drink, and I'll draw water for your camels also. Let her be the woman the Lord has appointed for my master's son. Before I had finished praying silently, there was Rebecca coming with her jug on her shoulder, and she went down to the spring and drew water. So I said to her, please let me have a drink. So she quickly lowered her jug from her shoulder and said, drink, and I'll water your camels also. So I drank, and she also watered my camels. Then I asked her, Whose daughter are you? She responded, The daughter of Bethuel, son of Nahor, who milk bore to him. So I put the ring on her nose and the bracelets on her wrist. Then I knelt low and worshipped the Lord, and blessed the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who guided me on the right way to take the granddaughter of my master's brother for his son. Now, if you are going to show kindness and faithfulness to my master, tell me. And if not, tell me, and I will go elsewhere. Laban and Bethuel answered, This is from the Lord. We have no choice in the matter. Rebekah is here in front of you. Take her and go. and Let her be a wife for your master's son, just as Yahweh the Lord has spoken. When Abraham's servant heard their words, he bowed to the ground before the Lord. Then he brought out objects of silver and gold and garments and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave precious gifts to her brother and her mother. Then he and the men with him ate and drank and spent the night. 
Now, the other reason why they're coming with all of these gifts and things is to show that they can take care of her, that they can cover all of her needs and that she won't live in, in poverty. So that's a nice thing to, for them to also do. But, but rather, when they got up in the morning, he said, send me to my master. But Laban, her brother and mother said, let the girl stay with us for about 10 days, then she can go. But he responded to them, do not delay me, since Yahweh has made my journey a success. Send me away so that I may go to my master. So they said, let's call the girl and ask her opinion. They called Rebekah and said to her, will you go with this man? She replied, I will go. So they sent her, <clears throat> excuse me, they sent away their sister Rebekah and the one who had nursed and raised her and Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebekah saying to her, Our sister, may you become thousands upon ten thousands. May your offspring uh, possess the city gates of their enemies. Then Rebecca, cool, all the notes are up. Then Rebecca and her female servants got up, mounted the camels, and followed the man. So the servant took Rebecca and left. Now Isaac was returning from Beer Lahai Roy, for he was living in the Negev region. In the early evening, Isaac went out for a walk in the field, and looking up, he saw the camels coming. Rebecca looked up, and when she saw Isaac, she got down from her camel and asked the servant, Who is that man in the field coming to meet us? The servant answered, It is my master. So she took her veil and covered, her, excuse me, covered herself. Then the servant told Isaac everything that he had done. And Isaac brought her into the tent of his mother, Sarah, and took Rebekah to be his wife. And Isaac loved her, and he was comforted after his mother's death. Let's go on to Matthew 23 now. Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to, the, and to his disciples. The scribes and Pharisees are seated in the chair of Moses. Therefore, do whatever they tell you and observe it, but don't do what they do, because they don't practice what they preach. They tie up heavy loads that are hard to carry and put them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to lift even a finger to move them. They do everything to be seen by others, and they, they enlarge their phylacteries and, and lengthen their tassels. They love the place of honor at banquets and the front seats at the synagogues, greetings in the marketplaces, and be called rabbi by the people. But you are not to be called teacher. You are not to be called rabbi because you have one teacher and you are all brothers and sisters. Do not call anyone on earth your father because you have one father who is in heaven. And you are not to be called instructors either because you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You shut the door of the kingdom in, uh, of heaven in people's faces, for you don't go in, and you don't allow those entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to make, one co uh, to make one convert, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a child of hell as you are. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. I just read that. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, whoever takes an oath by the temple, well, that means nothing. But whoever takes an oath by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. Blind fools. And again, the word here, fool, literally means idiot. For which is greater? The gold or the temple that sanctified the gold? Also, whoever takes an oath by the altar, well, it, it means nothing, but whoever takes an oath by the gift that is on it, oh, then he's bound by his oath. You blind people, but which is greater, the gift on the altar or the altar that sanctifies the gift? Therefore, the one who takes an oath by the altar takes an oath by it and everything on it. 
the one who takes an oath by the temple takes an oath by it and by him who dwells on it. And the one who takes an oath by heaven takes an oath by God's throne and by him who sits on it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You pay a, a, a tenth the tithe of mint, dill, and cumin. Yet you have neglected the more weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. These things you should have done without neglecting the others. Blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but you gulp down a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup so that the outside of it may also become clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which appear beautiful on the outside, but inside are full of the bones of the dead and every kind of impurity. In the same way, on the outside, you seem righteous to people, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you. Scribes and, and Pharisees, hypocrites, you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, oh, if we had lived in the days of our ancestors, we wouldn't have taken part in the, in, with them in the shedding of the prophets' blood. We, we would have been far better than those people. So you testify against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. So fill up, then, the measure of your ancestors' sins snakes, brood of vipers. How can you escape being condemned to hell? This is why I'm sending you prophets, sages, and scribes. He's, he's kind of revealing again to them that he is God. Who is the one who sends the prophets to them? Who is the one who sends guides to them? It's God. God is the one who sends this. And here Jesus says, this is why I have been sending you these prophets. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. Saul did this, remember? So the righteous blood, so rather, so all the righteous blood shed on earth will be charged to you from the blood of righteous Abel uh, to the blood of Zechariah. Kind of an A to Z thing there son of Be uh, Berechiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly, I tell you, on all these things will come this generation. I'm going to reread that. Truly, I tell you, all these things will come upon this generation. Now, does it doesn't mean those actual physical people. In some cases, yes. Many of them, uh, many of the uh, disciples were murdered the same way. But also, this generation means... Um, the, the age of the church itself, because we've seen intense persecution since when Jesus went away, even till now, uh, as we await Jesus' return. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to, to gather your children. There we go. That's, that's the note. Uh, that's all the notes. Uh, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Let's go on to Nehemiah 13. At that time, the book of Moses was, again, typically this is the book of Deuteronomy, was read publicly to the people. The command was found in it that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever enter the assembly of God because they did not meet the Israelites with food and water. Again, this is during um, the Exodus itself. Instead, they hired Balaam against them to curse them, but God turned this curse into a blessing. When they heard the law, they separated all those of mixed descent from Israel. 
Now, before this, the priest Eliashib had been put in charge of the storerooms of the house of our God, and he was a relative of Tobiah. And he had prepared a large room for him, and where they had previously stored the grain offerings, the frankincense, articles, and the tents of grain, new wine and fresh oil prescribed for the Levites, singers, and gatekeepers, along with the contributions for the priests. So this um, guy, right, who's in charge of the storerooms, cleaned out one of the storerooms in the temple itself to make a room for his relative. While all this was happening, I was not in Jerusalem because I had returned to King Artaxerxes of Babylon in the 32nd year of his reign. It was only later that I asked the king for a leave of absence so I could return to Jerusalem. Then I discovered the evil that Eliashib had done on behalf of Tobiah by providing him a room in the courts of God's house. I was greatly displeased. And through all of Tobiah's household possessions out of the room, I ordered that the rooms be purified. And I had the articles of God uh, restored there, along with the grain offering and the frankincense. I also found uh, that I found out that because the portions of the Levites had not been given, each of the Levites and singers uh, performing the service had gone back to his own field. They weren't paying them, so they, they left to go back to their old jobs. Therefore, I rebuked the officials, asking, why has the house of God been neglected? I gathered the Levites, the singers together, uh, and stationed them at their posts. Then all Judah brought a tenth of the grain, new wine, and fresh oil into the storehouses. I appointed as treasurers over the storehouse the priest Shemaliah, the, the scribe Zadok, and Padiah of the Levites, with Hanan, son of Zakur, and uh, son of Mataniah to assist them, because they were considered trustworthy. They were responsible for the distribution to their colleagues. Remember me for this, my God, and do not erase the deeds of of faithful love I have done for the house of my God and for its services. At that time, I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath, and they were also bringing in uh, stores of grain and loading them on donkeys, uh, along with wine, grapes, and figs. All kinds of goods were being brought to Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, so I warned them against selling food on that day. The Tyrians living there uh, were importing fish and all kinds of merchandise and selling them on the Sabbath to the people of Judah in Jerusalem. I rebuked the nobles of Judah and said to them, What is this evil you are doing profaning the Sabbath day? Didn't your ancestors do the same, so that God brought all this disaster on us and on this city? And now you are rekindling his anger against Israel by profaning the Sabbath. When the shadows began to fall on the city gates of Jerusalem, just before the Sabbath, I gave orders that the city gates be closed and not opened until after the Sabbath. I posted some of my men at the gates so that no goods could enter during the Sabbath day. Once or twice, the, the merchants and those who sell all kinds of goods camped around outside Jerusalem. But I warned them, why are you not, sorry, why are you camping in front of the wall if you do it again? I'll use force against you. After that, they did not come again on the Sabbath. Then I instructed the Levites to purify themselves and guard the city gates in order to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember me for this also, my God, and look on me with compassion according to the abundance of your faithful love. In those days, I also saw Jews who had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, Moab, Half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod or, or the language of one of the other peoples, but they could not speak Hebrew. And I rebuked them, cursed them, beat some of them, and pulled out their hair. I forced them to take an oath before God and, and said, You must not give your daughters in marriage to their sons or take their daughters as wives for your sons. I lost my spot. Do, 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 do. Okay. Uh, or, or take their daughters as wives for your sons or yourselves. Didn't King Solomon, king of Israel, sin in matters like this? There was not a king like him among uh, many nations. He was loved by his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Yet foreign women drew him into sin. 
Why then should we hear about uh, you doing this terrible evil, acting unfaithfully against our God by marrying foreign women? Even one of our son, or rather, even one of the sons of Jehoiada, son of the high priest Eliashib, had become a son-in-law to Sanballat the Horonite. So I drove him away from me. Remember them, my God, for defiling the priesthood, as well as the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. So I purified them from everything foreign and assigned specific duties to each of the priests and Levites. I also arranged for the donation of wood at the appointed times and for the first fruits. Remember me, my God, with favor. All right, and that is all of the notes there. Let's go ahead and move on to Acts chapter 23. Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin. Remember, uh, he had been partially released from, from captivity, um, and they uh, the, the uh, commander the Roman commander who's over Jerusalem, um, had invited the Sanhedrin, which is the ruling class of the Jews, right? It's not just the ruling class. It's, it's the group of 72 elders who rule the Jews, basically. Um, and also the, the Pharisees and Sadducees and the high priests and all of these people brought them all together so they could make their case against Paul known. So Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience to this day. The high priest Ananias ordered those who were standing next to him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting there judging me according to the law, and yet in violation of the law? Are you or <coughs> excuse me? Are you ordering me to be struck? Those standing nearby said, do you dare revile God's high priest? I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest, replied Paul. For it is written, you must not speak evil of a ruler of your people. When Paul realized that some of them were Sadducees, who, remember, don't believe in um, the resurrection, they don't believe in uh, angels, they don't believe uh, anything happens after you die, they don't believe in miracles or any of those things, and the other part were Pharisees, who agree with all of this, he cried out in the Sanhedrin, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees, and I am being judged because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. This was smart on his behalf. When he said this, a, a dispute broke out between the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, and neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees affirmed them all, and the shouting grew loud, and some of the scribes of the Pharisees' party got up and argued vehemently, we find nothing evil in this man, so what if his spirit or an angel has spoken to him? When the dispute became violent, this Roman commander feared that Paul might be torn apart by them, and ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them and bring him back into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Have courage, for as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so it is necessary for you to testify about me in Rome. I told you he was going to Rome. When it was morning, the Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves under a curse at not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. There were more than 40 people who had uh, formed or joined into this plot. These men went to the chief priests and elders and said, We have bound ourselves under a solemn curse that we won't eat anything until we have killed Paul. So now you, along with the Sanhedrin, make a request to the commander that he bring him down to you, as though he were going to, uh, sorry, as though you were going to investigate his case more thoroughly. But before he gets near, we are ready to kill him. But the son of Paul's sister hearing about their ambush, came and entered the barracks and reported it to Paul. That Paul called one of the centurions and said, Take this young man to the commander, because he has something to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the commander and said, 
the prisoner Paul called me and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. The commander took him by the hand, led him aside, and inquired privately, What is it that you have to report to me? The Jews, he said, have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down to the Sanhedrin tomorrow, as though they are going to uh, hold a somewhat... Uh, so I hold a somewhat more careful inquiry about him. Don't let them persuade you, because there are more than 40 of them lying in ambush, men who have bound themselves into a curse, not to eat or drink until they have killed him. And now they are ready, waiting for your consent. So the commander dismissed the young man and instructed him, don't tell anyone that you have informed me about this. He summoned two of the centurions and said, I get 200 soldiers, again, centurion, that's a commander over 100 people, um, get 200 soldiers, so get your people ready, uh, with 70 cavalry and 200 spearmen, and go to Caesarea at 9 tonight. Also, provide mounts to ride so that Paul may be brought safely to Felix the governor. And he wrote the following letter, Claudius Lysias, to the most excellent governor, Felix. Greetings. When this man had been seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them, I arrived triumphantly with my troops and rescued him because I learned he is a Roman citizen. Well, that's not entirely true. We know this story, but whatever, he's saying this about himself. Wanting to know the charge that they were accusing him of, I brought him down before their Sanhedrin, and I found out that their accusations were nothing about sorry, were, were, were questions concerning their own law, and that there was no charge that merited death or imprisonment. When I was informed that there was a plot against the man, I sent him to you straight away. I also ordered his accusers to state their case against him in your presence. So the soldiers took Paul uh, during the night and brought him to Antipatris as they were ordered. The next day, they returned to the barracks, allowing the cavalry to go on with him. When these men entered Caesarea and delivered the letter to the governor, they also presented Paul to him. And after he read it, he asked him what province he was from. When he learned he was from Cilicia, uh, he said, I will give you a hearing whenever your accusers get here. And he ordered that uh, he be kept in, under guard in Herod's praetorium or palace. Bring up the rest of the notes here for you. There are quite a few... So we're going to be scrolling for a bit. And there we go. All right. So um, that's it for today. God willing, we'll be back tomorrow. Behold the word of the Lord.